I don't know about you, but man, I was super excited for today. Excited when I was asked by Pastor Pat, can, can you do, uh, can you introduce the 21 days of prayer and fasting? And I was like, yeah, I can do that. Um, and it was an easy thing for me, but I didn't know that this place was going to be this beautiful, that this stage was going to be set up like this. Because when I saw this stage on Christmas Eve, I said, man, I, I would love to preach with this stage. I've never seen something so beautiful. <laughs> You know what I loved about worship? I get to shout my prayers. I get to shout as loud as I can, as hard as I want to. And if you watch me, I'm fidgeting, I'm moving all over the place because I just feel God's Spirit moving within my heart to prepare me for the week ahead, to prepare me for the day ahead. So it's not just a worship so that I praise Him. It's actually I'm singing that as my prayer. Do I believe what I'm singing? And by allowing that to saturate the heart so that out of the abundance of the heart, I begin to speak. Crazy. I wanted to just, I, I get a bunch of notes. I wanted to just throw them out because I was like, yeah, man, I cannot do a better job than worship. But the question would be, what brought you to church? That was a big question I had to ask myself because why I came to church wasn't under the best condition. And I think God wanted my attention that eventually turned into affection for Him. He wanted to get my attention so He could win my affection. What would bring people to this church? Not just what brought you to church, but what would bring people to this church? I really believe what will bring people to this church is not just the invite, but the heart in which we love people, the heart in which we love God. And I just wanted to take the time. I mean, this stage is so beautiful, and why it's so beautiful is the vision of Pastor uh, Jay along with Rich and Jen Kaunahana. And why I wanted to acknowledge them is because what you see on stage is their love for the Lord and their love for this church. They're pouring out their gift and talent in ways so that we can appreciate it, and they donated it, their time, their effort, the materials that they had so that the gospel can be presented in ways that are attractive. I think God wants our very best in everything that we do, so... What brought you to church may not be the thing that will carry you on in the church. I hope the thing that will carry you on is the love of Christ that you see in this place. And what I see in your Pawaikai is the love of God being poured out by multiple people in multiple places. What brought me here was one of the worst Christmases I ever experienced 22 years ago. It was a a Christmas that I would never want to relive again. My family was falling apart, my marriage was falling apart, and I was desperate. I had a son who um, in November got lost at sea, and so they had a big search for him. And I never prayed so hard in my life. I'm not a person of prayer, but then I would pray, and I prayed, God, can you find him? Can you save him? Can you bring him back home? And they found him. And then along the way, um, I developed a hernia that same year. And then I had hernia surgery. They were right around Christmas. And right after having the Hernia surgery, we went to go look for a Christmas tree. And the reason why I, I wanted to look for the Christmas tree is because my marriage with Marsha wasn't going that good. And I thought, man, if, if, if I could sacrifice and right after surgery, if I could just impress her by saying, can we go look for a Christmas tree? Because she loves Christmas. I mean, I did everything, right, so that I could change my life. And on top of that, I'm a hairstylist back then. And it was the busiest season of my life. At Christmas time, everybody wants to do their hair. 
And everybody and their grandmother and everybody that, that ever wanted to, so I'd get calls and I'd be like, no, I'm booked. Oh, Pastor, I mean, uh, back then it was Calvin, can, can you just squeeze us in? And I, I, I'd squeeze him in. My, 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 my schedule would be double and triple booked and I'd be stressed out. How am I going to get these people out of there? And little did they know inside of me all this turmoil was going on. But it really prepared my heart for what the Lord wanted to do in my life. And my hope is that he prepares, like Pastor uh, Pat says, our hearts for 2019. But before we start a year, can I challenge you in this way? Because we only got one more day. Finish strong. No matter what your year has been like, no matter what 2018 has been, been like, my challenge to you, finish strong. Because without finishing strong, you enter into the next season of your life or the next year of your life with the same old struggles. What I failed to do was reflect upon the good that God had done and I was focusing on everything that was going wrong in my life. But it started me to begin to learn to pray. See, ask anything in my name and you'll receive. That's what I love about Christmas, you know. I got to, uh, my son asked me, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? And I said, you know the best gift you ever gave me was three years ago, you bought me a pair of Clark shoes. I've been wearing it ever since. I travel with it. I go every place with it, right? So I was asking, <laughs> what did I get? What brand new pair of Clark shoes for Christmas? See, you don't get if you don't ask. And you may as well ask for what you want because you're going to get stuff that you don't want. And I think that's how it is with God. If you start to learn to ask him for the right things, your dad wants to give it to you. And that's what I began to learn about prayer is that prayer allows God to help you. But you got to ask him. And for many of us, we, we don't ask him for what we should we ask him for everything else but the very things that we need. I never asked him to help me in my marriage. I never asked him to help me in my family. I never asked him to really help me in the workplace. I asked him for a house. I asked him for a car. I asked him for a lot of other things. But I never really asked him first, Lord, can you help me in my marriage? Can you strengthen me in my marriage? Can you strengthen me in my relationship with my kids? Can you strengthen me in my relationship with my coworker? Co-workers, can you strengthen me with my clients? Never did I ask him things like that. It was more of a bucket list that he could fulfill. So there's two things that I want you to remember and leave today, to pray and fast. See, prayer is our response, or should be our response to God. Fasting is our sacrifice. And what I hope that you will develop is a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. A place where it is a daily practice. You may not practice fasting every day, but an attitude that he is all you need. The attitude that you can start your day very simply, Lord, can you help me today? Amen. Learn to make it a lifestyle. See, it was a lesson that I learned coming back to the Lord. And it wasn't until I was in the struggle that I began to learn to pray for my family, to pray for my marriage, to pray for things that I never prayed before. And the amazing thing about all of the prayers that I prayed wasn't about me anymore. It was about, God, can you help me with my relationships that are falling apart? And God heard my prayer. In desperation, I started to cry out. It was at church for the very first time that in the middle of worship that I, I would begin to weep and I would begin to tear and I never know what was going on. I didn't, I didn't realize what was going on. All the tears just would drop. It would happen every single week for the next three months. Every time that I was in service and started to worship, the tears would begin to flow. It was so bad that every week I would not put Kleenex in my pocket. I put napkins in my pocket because I would wear out the Kleenex. 
But it was there that I learned to pray and I began to worship. And worship was my first beginnings of learning to pray. And then I started to serve. And funny, in the midst of serving, one of the things that um, most of the people that lead, lead um, groups within the church, they start off with prayer. And so it was a habit that I began to learn because I started to do things for the Lord. And then I joined this ministry called Life Change. And one of the things that it was based on was prayer. Everything in the sanctuary was prayed for. Everything that was done was prayed for. And I was like, man, this is a crazy place. I really didn't understand what was going on back then because I was a new Christian. But I saw something different. And it was there that Marsha and I, uh, our relationship began to begin to heal. And you know what was crazy about that? My prayer was, Lord, if you would just allow me to serve and not let Marsha grumble, I'll be okay. Right? Because... When I was 20-something, I, I was real active, loved the Lord, really didn't have a relationship, but really loved the Lord. So I served and did a lot of things in church, right? And she would say, are you going to church again? Didn't realize that, that it was taking away my relationship with her. So my prayer was, can you allow her to just allow me to serve and I'll be okay? But you know what was amazing? I had people pray, can you pray for Marsha and I? And what is amazing uh, about it is Pastor Larry, who is an overseeing person for the prayer team at New Hope Oahu, asked Marsha, guess what she asked, he asked her to do? Can you type out the prayer tab and pass it back to me so I can get out to the intercessory team to pray? And to my amazement, she said yes. And can you see where, when Pastor Pat asked me, can you do prayer, it was an easy thing because what I realized for me, it was a lifestyle not just for myself, but it was a lifestyle that my wife was going to enter into. And there, this was a transition and this was a, a transformation in our lives that would amazingly come to where we are today. And so after uh, we went through the first session of life change, right, um, some people asked us, would you like to volunteer? And I said the same thing. Hey, I'm willing to volunteer, but if you could get my wife to volunteer, that would be amazing. Um, because if, if she doesn't serve, then I don't think I could serve. So m this friend of mine that I met in, in Life Change, right, goes and asks Marsha, Marsha, would you like to help us? Because we need some help um, on the prayer team. And she said, um, go ask Calvin, I'd love to. If he says yes, then I'll join. <laughs> Crazy, I, I tell him, if you could get her, and then she's telling him, if you could get and so we both say yes. And so we come out to the very first time and they say, can you be intercessors? I didn't know what an intercessor was back then. He says, oh, just pray for this place. Just, just um, anoint everything and then just plead the blood of Jesus. I didn't know what plead the blood of Jesus, but I pled it, you know. And, and so I, I did everything they asked for, right, for a whole season. And then later on, um, we met some of the people from um, Life Change. It was called Cleansing Stream back then. And they introduced us to prayer and they gave us handouts of how we should pray and, and um, the foundations of prayer. And, and funny, you know, when, when they gave up that, that information, it came with a question. Would you guys lead the intercessory prayer team? Can you imagine? This is our first year back to church, right? Recovering our relationship with the Lord. Go through a program. They ask us to serve and, and ask us to intercede. By the end of the session, they're asking us to lead the session. Lead, lead the prayer team. I'm like, what? And then this is what they would say. Can you pray about it? You ever got asked that question? People ask you, and then they, they give you this. Would you do this, but can you pray about it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And junk, because if you pray about it, most of the time, what the answer? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? It's okay, Lord. And, and, and so I hate it when they ask me something, and they tell me pray about it. Why I got to pray about it? Uh, I just got to say yes already, right? <laughs> because uh, if I say no, I, I, I won't be pleasing the Lord. What I learned to do as I mature is learn to say yes when I need to say yes. And I can say no to certain things now. Where before I would say yes to every single thing. But see, but the, because of the maturity and because of prayer, I can go in prayer and then the Lord can shut the door and say, no, I don't think you need to do that. I think that'll be a distraction to you. But see, in my des desperation, I began to learn to pray. 
And I began to learn how to lead teams to, to pray. Then, then not only did we get asked to um, uh, be the leaders for the intercessory prayer team, we also got asked to um, lead the prayer ministry team. So we had to develop uh, prayer team members. And then after that, right, Pastor Wayne asked us, right, Pastor Larry is stepping down from the role of overseeing the, the, the prayer team. It says, Calvin, can you and Marsha take over the prayer team for New Hope Oahu? And that was like crazy. It was like, no way, Lord. This is, this is too big for us. And back then, it was really big because our church was, I think, 16,000. This is when... Um, New Hope Hawaii Kai was being planted out, and at the same time, uh, New Hope Leeward was being planted out. At the same time, they were opening the Sand Island campus because the overflow of Farrington was huge, right? And so Pastor Wei says, can you oversee every single site? And I'm like, oh, that's New Hope Oahu, Sand Island site, Hawaii Kai, and Leeward, and we gotta do all, and, and I'm working full time now. And said yes to Jesus. Came out to Hawaii Kai. Hawaii Kai started at a midweek. Developed a prayer team there. Little did I know that this would lead, right, to me eventually becoming a pastor. But it started a process of, of me allowing the Lord to use me in ways because I allowed myself to develop a prayer life. And really, the basic definition of a prayer life is real simple. Just talk to God. You don't have to make it real complicated, like um, our Father and, and Thou art and Father Jesus and, and, you know. No, it's more than that. It's just a way of us to communicate our emotions, to communicate our feelings, our desires to God, and fellowship and have intimacy with Him. That simple. In the middle of worship, I'm able to share my emotions and my feelings. And I am giving up, you know, I'm giving up my desires for his. And then what happens is the intimacy of fellowship with God in the midst of it. So in prayer, it doesn't always have to be audible. It can be silent. It can be in your heart. It can be in your thoughts. It doesn't always have to be public. It can be private. In fact, the best place is in that secret closet. It can be formal or informal. There's times where I lead formal prayers. There's times that it's informal. But what I hope is that our prayer is not a grocery list or bucket list. Our Father who art in heaven, can you give me this? Can you give me that? Can you do this for me? See, when I prayed... I prayed it for what I needed or what I wanted or when something went wrong. If you really want to change things, God's word asks us to pray. pray. Prayer should not be an option for us as a Christian. God's word asks us to pray. That's why that scripture in your notes, and you can take out your notes, it's, Hear the supplication of your servant and your people, Israel. When they pray toward this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. See, what I learned about prayer is I could pray, pray from any place. Not just from this place, because that's what the Bible, I mean, that's what this is talking about, right? That place right, that temple that they could pray from. But that's what Jesus said, you are the temple. And so I learned that that this temple could pray towards heaven, his dwelling place that he would hear and that he would forgive. What was so interesting about when I joined um, the Ministry of Life Chain, when I went to the very first session, was in the small group time that they asked us to pray. One of the best pray- prayers that I ever prayed was for the first time I asked, Lord, this time I'm for real. Can you plant me in fertile soil? I didn't realize how impactful that prayer would be to why I'm here today. See, because I've been every type of seed. 
And funny, when I thought I was the most faithful, right, all of a sudden, the weeds and the thorns and all, all the things that would choke life out began to grow in my life because I got more concerned about me, the success, the money, the position, the titles. Everything about it began to choke me out, and I never asked him, Lord, plant me in fertile ground. And probably was the worst prayer that I could pray, pray for because one of the things about fertile ground is that it has to be tilled again and again and again. It takes years to take barren, unused land or land that has been used over and over again, right? To be tilled, to be composted, to be planted, to be tilled. And you're thinking, Lord, why am I going uh, through all of this? But this is what prayer does, and this is what prayer did for me. The six things that I'd like to share, it builds our relationship with Jesus. It began to help me to become dependent on Jesus. The other part, it, it helped me to overcome temptation. One of the things that I had to do when I first came to church was I had to get rid of all my drinking friends. I had to say goodbye to the world, and I had to say Lord, help me to find the people that you want to surround my life, my wife, and my family's life with. And so what I have to do is take away the distractions or the temptations, but prayer helped me to the, do that. The other thing that I learned, to know God's will. I would know my will, I would know the kids' will, I would know their desires, but did I know God's will and God's desire? And when you do, and when you cry out, number four, prayer accomplishes God's task or God's work or God's mission. What it also is, five, it's a weapon of warfare against the enemy. That whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a spiritual warfare that can take place because of your prayer. And I learned to pray in a way that would be warfare against the enemy. Number six, and this is the hope of why we are doing it as a corporate family, a prerequisite to spiritual awakening. If we want to win our marriages, if we want to win our families, if we want to win our homes, if we want to win our community, it's got to start with prayer. If we are not willing to pray as a church, then how can God reach the community? How can he reach our homes? And what I want to share with you is not just the pastor's job to pray for you, it's not just the prayer team's job to pray for you. The hope is that everybody will learn to pray for themselves. And the hope is that you begin to learn to pray for each other. Amen. See, the most important prayer is not a reaction. Because for most of us, right, my prayer life was mostly a reaction. When my son got lost, they see my reaction was, Lord, you got to find him. It was a reaction. I didn't pray, Lord, they're going out to see, can you protect them? Can you keep them safe? No, it was a reaction. A reaction to something that already happened. When things began to go bad in my marriage, I began to pray for my marriage, but it was a reaction. And so you can write that in bullet number one. Prayer is a call to action, not a reaction. I learned that prayer is what God calls me to do first. It's not me reacting because of my situation. This is what Jeremiah 29, when you call on me and come and pray to me, I'll listen to you, right? And then it's our life verse for New Hope, right? For I know the plans for you, says the Lord of hope, plans to prosper you for a hope and for a future. But see, he also asks us stuff before he promises us, he says to build, to build your homes, to plant, to eat what you plant, to marry, to have children. In Jeremiah 29, 7, it says, seek peace and prosperity. 
Are you willing to pray for it? That's what he asked. Pray for it so that it will prosper. Pray for it so that it will prosper. Pray for that, that it will happen. So when you call on me and when you pray, I will listen because you are asking for what I'm asking you. And then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. It was then that I began to understand the depth of prayer. If you, Calvin, called by my name, will humble yourself. I didn't humble myself. He had to humble me. He had to put me in a situation that caught my attention, that brought humility, that caused me to seek his face, that caused me to turn from every single worldly way that I had, that I would hear his voice, and that he would do this for me if I asked. There would he begin to heal and forgive me, begin to heal my marriage, begin to heal the things that he wanted me to possess. And so I want us to understand that prayer is a lifestyle. It's not a bucket list. It's not a time where we can come, hey, Lord, I need this and I need that. There's so many scriptures in the Bible, right? Job, you will pray to him and he will hear you and he will fulfill your vows. Psalms, he will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which he has called you. How many need hope? Because it's your glorious in, in inheritance as God's holy people. I mean, you can go through the Bible, and that's what Pastor Pat will take us through, different prayers in the Bible that will help us to understand why we pray. And James says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask for, with the wrong motives. And that's one of the things that I learned, the motivation of why I pray. Most of the time it was selfish. When my prayers began to be concerned more about others than myself, wow, God began to hear my cry. But it really didn't stop just with learning to pray. One of the things that we had to learn to develop, and I learned to develop as an intercessor, is a lifestyle of fasting. And sometimes that's not that easy to do because what do I fast? How do I fast? I didn't know much about fast. But this is what I, I learned about fasting, right? And I learned that from Ezra. See, Ezra was going through a time in the exile that he was supposed to return back to Jerusalem. And so he had assembled the priests and the Levites and the people to go back to build the temple of the Lord, right? That they had finished rebuilding. And one of the things that they were supposed to do is take back all the articles um, that belonged in the temple. And so the articles, right, was gold and silver. So it was a lot of value. There was a lot of money involved in the transaction of moving from Babylon into Jerusalem. And Ezra calls a fast so they might humble themselves, right, and pray for protection on that journey. But I think the reason why Ezra calls the fast was he spoke too soon. Earlier, he was overconfident about what the Lord would do. He, thought, he said that the Lord would be gracious and his hand would be upon them, that they would gain favor and protection because God's great anger would protect them against the enemy. But I think when Ezra began to realize the thing that he was going to do, the journey back to Jerusalem was not going to be that easy because with that much money, um, guarantee somebody won't steal it from you. And the king had offered him protection. But he said, no, no, my, my God is going to take care of it. And all of a sudden, he realized, oh, we are not soldiers. We're priests. We're Levites. And we're taking our family with us. I kind of go back to the king and, and humble myself and and ask him, can you now help me? This is what Ezra did. Instead of humbling himself for, before the king, he'd humbled himself before the Lord. See, one of the things I learned about fasting, fasting allowed me to humble myself before the Lord. Before I had to humble myself before my wife, before I had to humble myself before my friends, before I had to uh, humble myself before people, 
I had to humble myself before the Lord because I didn't know what humility looked like. And it was through learning to pray and fast that I began to learn what Ezra learned. That fasting is not just, and this is what part of it is, is not just acknowledging dependence on God. I think it's really about the posture of humility and preparing our hearts before the King. And so the hope is in this season that you take the time in the next few days or next week before we start the series is to prepare your hearts for the fast. Over the next week, on the 6th, we'll start the 21 days of fast. Ask the Lord, what do you need to fast? For, for some, maybe coffee. For some, maybe social media. For some, it may be a vegetarian. It may be whatever God is asking you, but I want you to go and ask the Lord, what is it that you want me to fast? And I want you to be safe. Because if you have a medical condition, we don't want you to, to jeopardize your health. And so if you're going to fast food and you have a condition or whatever your medical condition, right, make sure that it's safe. Get, get an okay from your doctor. If not, you know, TV, whatever it is, do something. For me, the first thing I learned to do was I fasted coffee because I was a coffee addict. The next thing that I, I fasted was uh, games on my iPhone because I love to play games on my phone. I would waste a lot of time. Then I learned to do a Daniel fast. Then I learned to do a blood of Jesus fast. And what I did was I would take the grape juice, I would consecrate it to the Lord. And for a week, all I would do was drink grapefruit juice. I mean, not grapefruit, uh, grape juice. You can do whatever the Lord asks you to do. It's not something that we require. It's you going before the Lord. And you know what is amazing? The more and more you pray, the more and more you go before the Lord, the more and more you stay in God's word, you begin to hear his voice. In preparing this message, hearing God's voice. In any decision that I make, it's hearing God's voice. So what I share with you, the lifestyle of prayer, you may not hear me pray audible very much, but it is constant within my mind. A conversation is going on in my brain. God, what do you want me to do? How do I handle this situation? This is what I'm thinking. This is what is going on. This is what I'm feeling. This is what is happening. Lord, I need help. I need you to, to get me to that right place. I need you to give me words because my reaction wants to say this. My heart is burdened. My heart is hurt now. I want to get even. And then all of a sudden, this fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who has already gave you the endurance in which to run the race. And so in the midst of the struggle that I know that my endurance is not going to come from me, my strength is not going to come from me, but my strength is going to come from him. Why? Because the lifestyle of prayer is constant. Amen. And you can write in number two, fasting humbles you, yourself before mighty God. What I learned is that he is a mighty awesome God. There is no other God like him. There will be no other God like him. When you ask anything in his name and in his will, he will answer. The struggle is get to know his will. For the past 22 years, the greatest journey that I've been on is to seek God's will, to know God's will, not just for my life anymore, but for the lives that he allows me to influence. And so the thoughts that, that I have is not his thoughts. And so what I needed to learn, teach me your thoughts. Teach me your ways, because my ways are not your ways. And it only can come when you seek him. Father, not my will, but your will be done. You've won my affection. Amen? Amen. The hope is that he's won your affection. And that was a song that I, as I was coming here, 
is what I heard. You can come up, man. I was kind of singing. I was kind of embarrassed. I should I sing it? But I could sing it because it doesn't matter the voice, it's the heart in which you sing. You've won my affection. You've captured my heart. Now I am yours, completely yours, forever. See, he caught my attention, but what he really wanted was my affection. Why? Because I am now completely his, not just for today, but forever.